Okay, okay. Today uh, we're gonna update uh, uh, my shining uh, Stanley Kubrick shining lectures. So we'll get started. I I have uh, been wanting to do this for quite a while, so I'm glad to do it uh, uh, now. Anyways, um, some preliminaries first. I uh, just wanted to make you aware uh, that in 2001, the first words spoken uh, in the movie. Uh, other than ape grunting sounds, are made by a stewardess who uh, i almost positive is wearing uh, Jackie Kennedy's uh, dress and hat, uh, uh, the exact same uh, outfit that uh, Jackie Kennedy was wearing when uh, JFK was shot. So um, I don't know um, if Kubrick, uh, even during 2001, was uh, somewhat dismayed, but uh, look at that outfit of that stewardess when the door, the the Haywood Floyd gets to the to the space station, um, uh, the the intermittent space station, not the moon space station, but the the space station that's between the uh, the, the basically that cylindrical. Uh, uh, Ferris wheel that he lands in. Uh, that woman is wearing Jackie Kennedy's uh, exact outfit that she was wearing when uh, JFK was shot, and she was there. Anyways, just wanted to let you know about that. Um, here you go. You guys will love this. Um, I was uh, well. I wasn't wrong. I, I said if anybody would find another movie with rolling credits at the beginning, I would be. Uh, I'd be happy. I banked that, that probably nobody could, but guess what? I have found it. So I'm the first one to find another movie with rolling credits. And you're not going to believe the title of it. Destination Moon. I um, uh, encourage everyone to go out uh, on YouTube and find Destination Moon and watch the beginning credit scenes. And there's rolling credits. And I place uh, a million dollar bet that Kubrick uh, definitely saw uh, the movie Destination Moon. Why he would put rolling credits in The Shining as opposed to uh, putting rolling, if he wanted to emulate Destination Moon, he should have put rolling credits in 2001. But instead he put it in The Shining. Hmm, kind of interesting that he would put in The Shining exact same uh, rolling credits that are in uh, the movie Destination Moon um, from the... I believe the 50s. Okay. Um, and now to show you how stupid we all are, including me, because I've seen the movie now some 30 times, and and uh, I, I didn't realize it until um, uh, until just recently, um, that um, I'm the only one, I believe, on the Internet that has said that I believe Jackie, Wendy, and Danny, all three of them are Stanley Kubrick. And I, I, I will show you how Kubrick is so subtle, you don't even realize. The chess game he is playing is shrouded in his uh, penultimate uh, genius. The very first uh, black screen, uh, titled Black String, says, Interview. The Interview. And we're all like, oh, okay, yeah, Jack Nicholson has an interview. I don't know why you labeled an interview. That's kind of silly. That's not what J Stanley Kubrick meant by interview. The whole scene until the next black titled scene is three interviews. Not one interview of Jack Nicholson. There are three interviews. Jack Nicholson is interviewed. Danny is interviewed by the doctor who asks him, asks him incessantly, uh, incessant questions. And then the doctor interviews Wendy. All three characters are interviewed. When Stanley Kubrick wrote the interviewer interviews on that black screen, the first black screen, he's, he's right there telling you. I'm binding all three characters together. Find one other person on the internet of the three, eight billion people on the earth or whatever, uh, that have, have figured that out. All three characters are Stanley Kubrick. 
I've already proved that with several mirror shots of my other lectures you can go look at. But, uh, but this was, this was the clincher when I realized, oh my god, I'm so stupid. Although, I'm less stupid than everybody else, uh, who's made these, uh, shiny because I'm, at least I'm the first one who, uh, realized this. Okay, let's move on to, uh, Almond. <laughs> I was, recently I was able to see, um, uh, the Shining, they showed it at the, at a theater. So I was able to see it nice and big. And when you see it big, you can see all the other details, uh, Kubrick has, uh, has placed into it. Although I wish I almost had a remote control to pause it on a gigantic theater screen. But one of the things that just stood out to me that just shocked me, uh, real quickly is Omen, <laughs> when he holds his hands up, you can see that there are four buttons on his shirt and only two buttons on his jacket on his left hand if you look at his left uh, arm as he puts his arm up it's a real quick shot out of i believe it's only showed once but there are four buttons on a shirt and two on the jacket now i know people are like you I, I hate numerology. I'm not a numerologist. I don't, although I do do mathematics, of course, as you can see from my other, other lectures. But I'm not the type of person that goes, hey, what are your letters in your name? Let's change it to numbers. I'm not a numerologist. But the numbers, like I said, like my lectures said before, you can go look at them, that were, you know, the uh, the number 42. And, and my comment, my next comment will really uh, show you something. But I was going to stick with this comment is, that the number 42 plays, of course, huge um, relevance in this uh, movie. Um, and, and and so, uh, yeah, yeah, I was, you know, I was like, maybe they do make shirts with four buttons. Although it would be a nightmare to button those, uh, that, that shirt. It's like, you see those four buttons and you're just like, oh my god, how did the guy, he, he must have had to have somebody button it for him. I, I have trouble buttoning it when when there's one button on a shirt. Um, so, but I thought, hey, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm a scientist, so I gotta, I gotta, I don't believe, you know, hey, maybe, maybe there's four button shirts out there. So I type in Google, you know, four button on this, four button sleeve shirts, four button shirts, you know, uh, sleeve, four button shirts, all permutations and images. I could not find one image of a, a sleeve shirt that had four buttons out there of anybody who would, you know, you think at least the president would have a four button a shirt, and you'd tie, you know, a presidential four button sleeve shirt, you know. I could not find one, so again, I'll give, I'll, I'll give out the challenge. If anybody can find a picture of a four button shirt, I will give away that this, uh, th this, this is, uh, Total BS. But I mean, on top of the fact that there's, you know, the but there's only two buttons on the jacket. I mean, usually jackets have three buttons, not two buttons, you know. So, uh, the number 42, uh, plays prevalently and I, it just, it, I, it shocked me when I saw it because I'd never seen a shirt with four buttons. And here we go. I don't think, uh, the, the, one of the most obvious things that I, I think I left out in my lectures earlier, when Danny's standing in the uh, in front of the mirror before he has a seizure in the bathroom, I, I don't think I mentioned it before, and I really was angry that I didn't. But of course, his shirt says forty two, has the number forty two on his shoulder. You know, uh, I think it's a Bugs Bunny like sweater or something. But he's got a, a forty two uh, right on the shoulder there. So I mean, the, the, the Kubrick is just putting so many, uh, uh, so many. Uh, messages, uh, confirmations is what I mean. Is He's just saying, look, look, look if you can find it. Okay, um, here's another thing that I believe I was wrong about. Uh, when I talked about um, that I saw the movie An Affair to Remember uh, with Cary Grant, I believe, um, and, 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 and that, that he had said that watch it or I'll paint you with a uh, the streak of yellow fake, you know? Well, I watched An Affair to Remember, and all I wanted to do was, like, record him saying it, and for some reason, I could not find it in there. So I think I may have... 
I may have gotten it confused with, uh, recently I'd also seen another, I believe it's a Cary Grant movie, called A Touch of Mink. All right, I can't remember who else is in that. So it's possible, I'm almost positive Cary Grant is the one who said it. I know somebody said it because I wouldn't make it. There's, I wouldn't even have ever thought to say that. Uh, and I've tried to look up the, uh, you know, paint you with a stripe of yellow to denote that you're faking. And I can't find any references to it in the um, uh, on Google. Uh, but then again, um, they're already, like, as you can see from one of my lectures uh, about the pink and the yellow tennis ball, <laughs> they're already changing the shining uh, <laughs> from a yellow tennis ball fake to a pink one, so who knows what they're doing, uh, uh, the control they have over internet stuff. I know I'm being uh, somewhat uh, paranoid there, but uh, I, if, when you're changing pink tennis, yellow tennis balls to pink, something uh, something is really uh, perturbing you. Yeah. Okie dokie. Um, just as... Um, uh, these uh, don't have to do with the movie, and I'll have more updates later on. But but one of the things that I just recently found out is, I, I mentioned to you uh, before in one of my lectures that that uh, Kubrick may have wanted to make this this confession in, in The Shining because he had seen uh, Peter Himes' um, a Capricorn 1 film. And I mean, that one was released in, I think, 78, and uh, Shining was released in 80 or whatever, and a couple years later. Um, and, and I think that Kubrick probably thought, wow, this guy really has balls. I mean, he's, he's just coming out and saying, you know, uh, stuff is faked and this is how it's faked. And, and he did a pretty good job at, at, at justifying that, uh, these astronauts, um, might have gone along with it. Well, anyways, what I found out recently is that I was looking through a book. I think it was, uh, you know, one of the Arthur C. Clarke's 3001 or 2061. Well, when you look at the other books that he's done, I saw one of them was uh, a book with Peter Hyams, and I'm like, "What? He Arthur C. Clarke, the inventor of the satellite that orbits the Earth? You know, the 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 the, the scientist. He's he's writing a book, and this this book, I'm pretty sure this book was written with Peter Hyams um, uh, uh, after 2001 was. I'm sorry, after Capricorn One was made, um, I believe." And so I was just, I was just amazed that Arthur C. Clarke would work with a guy who had made the, the number one conspiracy moon movie, uh, of this. It's just like, what a weird mix, you know, the one guy who says that, the, the one guy who's a scientist and is, a uh, Arthur C. Clarke is an actual physicist. He's got a degree. He's, he's published papers. He, he invented the satellite, uh, that, that orbits the earth. You know, we wouldn't have any of our iPhones and stuff like that working. Uh, without Arthur C. Clarke's uh, ideas, although probably somebody else would have discovered. But on top of that, this will blow you away, Peter Himes, the director of Capricorn One, also directed what movie? He also directed 2010, the sequel to 2001. So I'm just wondering what the studio people, uh, here you go at MGM, the same, the same studio that, uh, that, that, uh, here's, here's the, the DVD booklet that comes with 2010 movie. Um, the same people at MGM, you know, I, I, I don't know who the company was who made, um, I'll have to find out who the company was that made, um, Capricorn One, if it was, I don't think it was MGM. I'd be astounded if they, if they made it. But here's MGM d hiring the guy who made the most, still to date, there has never been another uh, conspiratorial movie about Moon, except for Interstellar. They do make they do make some comments in Interstellar, um, the, the 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 Christopher Nolan movie um, about how the, the I don't know the daughter said that. Uh, the, 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 the country doesn't believe we landed on the moon and the daughter believes in it. So about, that's about the only thing, but it's an offhand comment and it actually takes the side of NASA. You know, I think it makes the, uh, the Matthew McConaughey, uh, character, uh, 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 sympathetic to, uh, to, to confirming that NASA did go to the moon. But, so anyways, 
Here's MGM hiring the guy who made the most conspiratorial moon landing movie to do a blockbuster, a, a, a sequel to one of the greatest movies, 2001. This whole booklet is filled about how 2010 tried to match the, the immensity. So they're putting in, <laughs> they're hiring the guy who made the most conspiratorial we didn't go to the moon movie to direct 2010. And it's not like they did it and they said, oh, well, people will have watched Capricorn 1 and will want to see this director because he made Capricorn 1. No, most people who saw 2010 had forgotten about 2000 and, I'm sorry, Capricorn 1 uh, by then. So let alone the fact that Arthur C. Clarke would work with this uh, conspiratorial movie maker is just beyond my, uh, just something is, something's uh, fishy in Denmark, we'll just say, okay? All right, so that's Peter Hyams and Arthur C. Clarke getting together. Uh, Frickin' frack. Um, the, recently there was released the first man movie, uh, about, uh, um, about, uh, I believe it was, uh, um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, the Neil Armstrong, of course. And, um, I'm sitting in the theater watching this movie, First Man, and I'm wondering, what? why is it 2018 or whatever, and this is the first movie, you know, this is the first movie of the greatest moment in human history. I was just like, it just dawned on me. I know it sounds like a stupid question, but it's an ingenious question once you think about it. You're sitting, it's 2018. It's literally uh, nearly 50 years, and there hasn't been one movie of the life of Neil Armstrong, the greatest human, you know, who did the greatest feat, first feat, oh, <laughs> pun intended, it put the first feet on the moon, and did the greatest scientific feat ever, and um, and we haven't seen a, a movie about his life. So, I mean, I, I thought about that and whatever, and then I was curious, I was like, oh, well, he when did he die? When did Neil Armstrong, oh, 2012. And I'm like, well, I guess that's a, that's a long time if you want to be a conspiracy nut to, to wait around to... Uh, you know, to make the movie, if if you if you just wanted to wait until Neil Armstrong was um, dead before you uh, started lying about his life, uh, that's a long time to to um, to wait. And um, so so I I, I I I didn't think much of it after that. But then <laughs> again, I don't know how I accidentally run into these. Uh, cases, and, 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 and what I found out was that the first man director had, had, uh, the, the Ryan, Ryan guy, the, 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 the actor who plays, um, the actor who plays, um, Neil Armstrong. I can't remember his name, I'm sorry. Something Ryan or Ryan Gosling, that's what it is. It's Ryan Gosling. He had him in mind before he filmed La La Land. So the director who filmed First Man directed La La Land. And La La Land was, was released in 2016. Now, probably, I mean, La La Land looks like a pretty, uh, pretty extensive movie. It looks like it took for a quite, a, quite a while for you to, uh, 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 film that movie, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, so maybe, maybe a year, a year and a half to film it, plus the pre-production, you know, getting all the, 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 buying this, buying that, you know. So this director, I found in, a, in, in an interview, he said, oh yeah, I, I had a Ryan Gosling in, in mind for First Man as playing Neil Armstrong before I even started, before I even cast him in, in La La Land. I mean, we're talking probably two years, you know. So now we're back in 2014, at least, probably around 2014, when the director of La La Land is thinking about Gross, Ryan Gosling and writing a screenplay with his brother about the first man landing on the moon. Well, now we're getting pretty close to the death of 
uh, you know, uh, when, when Neil Armstrong died, because, okay, Neil Armstrong dies, NASA, you know, all these, all these things, 2012, by then, the, the, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of footage out there of, uh, uh, YouTube videos about how the moon landings are fake, they're going over the pictures, everyone's going this, so NASA starts going, hmm, maybe we should make a movie, you know, uh, he's dead, we can say anything we want about him any, anymore, I, uh, um, uh, he he won't object anymore. Uh, he might roll over in his grave, but he won't object to it, uh, or he can't object to it, of course. Um, so so I can see, you know, 2012, a year to put for NASA to put this stuff together, try to find the correct director, and uh, start telling this director of La La Land. I'm sorry, I don't know, I can't, I don't know his name. To um, hey, we'd like to hire you to, you know to shoot a movie about the life of Neil Armstrong. And you're looking at 2013-14, and then the guy goes, hmm, hey, maybe I should get Ryan Gosling uh, to, uh, to to film in that. I, I don't know, he would be perfect as Neil Armstrong, you know? Then three or four months later, he goes, hmm, because apparently he was writing the screenplay for First Man, uh, you know, even back then with his brother or whatever. I think he said he was writing his the screenplay with his brother. You guys will you can do all the research you want on it. Um, but, um, you know, six months after that, he goes, huh, I think I'll make La La Land. Oh, uh, that guy that I thought of making Neil Armstrong, I'll make him in La La Land. You know, it's just like, wow. So, um, that's why I was sitting in the theater and watching in 2018 or whatever, uh, the first movie ever of the greatest first human on earth that walked on the moon the first time. One of the greatest feats man, I, I would assume, that man has ever done. Uh, it took 50, 50 years for them to decide to make a movie about it. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Maybe uh, Neil Armstrong didn't want a movie about that made. All right. Okay. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention before is um, a lot of people uh, might not accept the 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 yellow duck the yellow duck, uh, the yellow duck uh, uh, lecture. Although it's my most popular, of course, of uh, lecture number six is my most popular lecture, of course, um, uh, of all the seventeen lectures by by a tenfold. Um, but. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if, I know if I offer people, uh, or if you offer people a hundred dollars to tell you which room in a house a little yellow rub rubber duck, uh, will be found in, um, I think they would all say, uh, uh, especially if you offer them a hundred, uh, bucks, um, the bathroom, not the bedroom. Okay. Let alone the fact that the shot previously had the duck in the bathroom and, uh, and, and the next shot has the duck obviously not in the bathroom as I stated in lecture number six um, but on the windowsill and uh, some people have said eh, maybe the mother moved it so the mother stepped over her seizured kid on the floor that's passed out picked up a yellow duck from the bathtub and walked over to the windowsill I don't know carrying her son and the yellow duck and decided hmm, you know my, my son has passed out and, I'm, I, and it's so serious I'm going to call a doctor but I think I'll move this yellow duck from the bathtub to a windowsill yeah, sounds logical to me. Um, all right. Well, it's been 23 minutes. It was way longer than I thought it was going to be. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I look forward to any comments at the bottom. Thank you very much.